Well, thank you everyone for joining us here today. And I think uh, Dazdi, Mulroy, and Elon set a wonderful stage for us to move into the next phase of the discussion. We will focus on Syria and the way forward for the United States. Um, I'd like to quickly introduce our panelists. We have an all-star crew today, and then just launch into the discussion. To my left, we have Frances Z. Brown. Uh, she has decades of experience working in conflict zones and fragile states. She recently served on the MSC staff as a director for democracy. She's worked with other U.S. government agencies, including USAID, and she has a lot of experience understanding how post-conflict stabilization and democracy building can be done in the greater Middle East. To her left is Hassan Hassan, She's the director of the program on non-state actors in fragile environments at the Center for Global Policy. Hassan is the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, ISIS, Inside the Army of Terror, which has become sort of a how-to manual on how to understand ISIS. He's a world-renowned expert on Salafist jihadist movements and other non-state actors, and his articles are some of the best that I've ever read on how to understand how ISIS and other Salafi jihadi organizations function. Last but not least, we have Juman Qadwar. She's a doctoral student at Georgetown University Law and a Next Generation Fellow here at CNAS. She's an expert on constitutional drafting and democracy building in the Middle East. She, have, she has a lot of experience working inside Syria and with Syrian-run organizations and consulting with other international actors on how to approach the way forward in Syria. So one of the dynamics that I'd like us to open with is a question that we alluded to in the fireside chat with Dazdi Mulroy, which is what is the enduring U.S. interest in Syria. Uh, President Trump has sort of emerged as a thought leader on the subject. Um, as recently as January, he stated that Syria was lost long ago. We're talking about sand and death. And while this represents sort of one of the currents in the discussion, there does seem to be an active debate within the American public and within the foreign policy-making community about what does the U.S. do now that ISIS seems to have been defeated and that Assad seems to have won on the ground. Hassan, I'd like to ask you to start us off. What is your perspective and what is the U.S. interest in Syria? And what is the way forward? Well, thank you for, very much for having me. Uh, I think the, I would say three things uh, related to Syria. Uh, the first one is uh, the CT element, the extremists, um, whether you're talking about ISIS or other jihadists uh, in northern, uh, northwestern Syria. Uh, the second one is uh, the broader conflict in Syria and the uh, possibility of uh, an unraveling in, in the Syrian conflict. And the third one is related to Iraq. So even if you don't care about Syria, if, you, if Syria is not an interest, uh, uh, is not seen as an interest or a threat, uh, I think Iraq, uh, if you're interested in Iraq, then Syria is very related to that, especially the eastern part of Syria, which is about uh, one, third, uh, one third of Syria and more. Uh, so to expand on each uh, element of those, uh, obviously now uh, we just heard, uh, uh, you know, ISIS just released a, a statement, a video uh, showing uh, Abu Bakr Baghdadi for the first time since he declared the caliphate in June 2014. Uh, uh, he looks very healthy, uh, despite the reporting recently over the past two years, uh, saying, uh, in including from defectors and people uh, captured, uh, like ISIS commanders captured by the Iraqis, who said he was ailing, he's sick, uh, slim. Uh, it wasn't like uh, what he appear, uh, how he appeared in 2014. Uh, I think he looks exactly like he appeared in 2014, except he grew a, a little bit older. Uh, I think probably <coughs> slow, more slowly than I did uh, over the past <laughs> three years. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that's a significant video uh, that he basically, this is a massive propaganda for the group because, again, over the past few two years, we've seen that people were saying he's irrelevant, he's dying, he's, uh, uh, he's very angry. Uh, all all uh, was gleaned from reporting uh, from uh, captured ISIS uh, commanders. But it seems like he's healthy. But also, more importantly, the organization is very healthy. And I'm talking about the core of the organization, not the caliphate, the territorial physical caliphate. And that has implications way beyond, uh, beyond Syria. In fact, uh, uh, for about, again, two years, what we're seeing is that the affiliates of ISIS, and this is the biggest failure, in my opinion, for, by the U.S.-led coalition, is that ISIS has been able to transition safely from being a, a, a caliphate, from holding territory, uh, we know the story, uh, into uh, becoming an underground insurgency organization. Uh, 
but I think contrary to my, uh, even to my expectations, uh, ISIS has expanded, not just gone on, uh, underground, expanded very relatively, uh, like very uh, slightly, not, not in a way uh, we expect probably in two years from now. Uh, what I mean by that is that ISIS affiliates outside Syria and Iraq has become more uh, like ISIS. They are closer to ISIS than we would imagine with the demise of, uh, of ISIS. That moment is big when they lost uh, the caliphate in Baghuz. Uh, we, uh, we would expect from any other organization that would at least fracture, you'd see some elements of it saying <coughs> we no longer are part of uh, Baghdadi's group, but we haven't seen that. Despite, you know, again, despite some of the reporting. Uh, that, that's very, very significant, and that has implications for long term. Because if he managed to say, I uh, built a caliphate, transitioned to insurgency, kept that war of attrition for a long time, uh, for another moment, another uh, opportunity in the future, and these opportunities exist in Syria, in Iraq, in the wider region, uh, then he could be able to, uh, he could uh, uh, position himself, present himself in the future as. Uh, a leader who, you know, made a difference at some point of time. Uh, but if he was killed, if these affiliates were fractured as uh, the uh, caliphate collapsed, then that would uh, undermine that project for a long time and uh, present an alternative to it. Um, uh, we've seen uh, their affiliate in Afghanistan, in Sinai, in Yemen, uh, even in, in West Africa, becoming more and more close, uh, closer to, to ISIS. By that, I mean they're becoming more in tune uh, with, with the propaganda, with the message, and also with the kind of targets they're targeting. Uh, and, and that's a trend, again, that's been going on since 2016 uh, because ISIS had more time, more resources to pay attention to these organizations. Also because ISIS recognized uh, something that the U.S.-led coalition should have recognized a long time ago, which is that if they fracture at this point when they lose the caliphate, then they will lose the narrative uh, war. But they haven't, uh, and this is a ver very sad for me as someone whose hometown is now destroyed because of this war uh, against ISIS. Uh, the, uh, the second one, so this is just ISIS, but then you have uh, Al-Qaeda uh, uh, originated or affiliate, whatever you want to call it, uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, uh, that has now de facto control uh, over uh, one province of Syria, uh, Idlib in northwestern Syria, and uh, not Turkey, not the Russians, not the regime are willing to take on that uh, threat. Uh, in fact, the regime is becoming less and less capable and willing uh, to go uh, and fight another war in northwestern Syria because they have to deal with, uh, uh, with providing gas and fuel to, their ca to the residents in, in Damascus and so on. Uh, so I think in, the jihadi thing is still there. It's growing. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, we could talk more about this. I think it's growing back in, uh, in eastern Syria. Uh, the second part... I want to talk very quickly about uh, the conflict. I think the U.S. has an interest to maintain some of the fragile gains that have been made in Syria over the past few years uh, or two years. Uh, it's the same framework, 2017. Uh, uh, that even though it's not a perfect case scenario, it's not ideal that the regime has won, but at least there's some uh, stability that you can use to build on that and, and, and kind of push against the regime and push against the jihadis and push against uh, other actors. And I think if, uh, if the U.S. leaves now, uh, the regime will be able to consolidate these gains uh, furthermore, and the jihadis will try to uh, grow back again. Uh, and I think the U.S. Uh, has, a, uh, has an opportunity still uh, to do something in, uh, in Syria. If the U.S. say pulls out of eastern Syria, the whole conflict unravels because you will see the regime coming back, trying to take some of the areas that the SDF uh, has, uh, Turkey will try to do the same. The Arabs and the Kurds will start fighting. It's going to be a mess. I think uh, that's one interest that they have to be. The, the final one, very quickly, I know I'm, go, I'm going on for, for um, uh, long. Uh, uh, Iraq. Iraq is very important because uh, now Iraqi security and long-term stability hinges, in fact, on this stability in eastern Syria because uh, the borders are porous. ISIS uh, is there, uh, the threat of ISIS at least. Uh, if there's any conflict there, that would immediately affect, uh, affect uh, places like Ambar, Nainawa, uh, and even the Kurdish uh, areas in the, in the northeast. Uh, 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 and I think these are very important uh, key, uh, key points that the U.S. has to pay, uh, to pay attention to. Thank you very much, Hassan. Shumana, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things. Um, I don't, I don't want to go over anything uh, Hassan has already mentioned, but 
couple of things since I work a lot with civil society and the, um, to f that the, you know, the U.S. interest in ensuring that the social conditions that not only allowed for the, for the conflict to begin with, but also have, you know, facilitated and accelerated the emergence of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, um, Haras al din et cetera, all these other, you know, Salafi jihadist groups, um, that, that should be, um, you know, a more pronounced, I think, part of um, the administration's goals. And I know it is definitely an interest, and I know Ambassador Jeffrey does, does discuss about, you know, hoping to re, um, sort of re-up our financial uh, investments in Idlib, which is, uh, a, I think, still a very important part of this puzzle. It's kind of been sidelined, but it remains an important piece of this puzzle. Um, and, and just ensuring that we address the actual social conditions um, because unless you address those things, the grievances that I'll go into later with the Assad regime and, and all these other actors, um, <clears throat> the, the risk is that this will return. And second, and, and the administration has made it very clear, its interest in pushing back on Iran. Um, and I think the danger with Iran is that it really doesn't care about how much the Syrian people actually have to suffer in terms of financial, you know, economic sanctions, etc. Um, it's, it's done this before in Syria, I mean, even prior to the conflict. Um, it's, and it's used to both of those, both the Syrian regime and Iran are used to sort of surviving, um, outliving um, economic uh, uh, sanctions. So this is, you know, the, but the, the issue with Iran is how long will our sanctions remain on there, especially if President Trump is not reelected in two years. Or does that leave them, it, I mean, the majority of the Democrat candidates have said that they will bring back the JCPOA. Um, our European allies have found ways to sort of go about it, go around it. Um, for, for some elements of the, of the, um, the JCPOA uh, agreement. So um, I think that pushing back on Iran should be and should remain an, a vital U.S. interest in dealing with Syria. I'll stop there. I'll let, Thank you, Jumana. Yeah. Francis? Yeah, and I, I agree with everything my colleagues have laid out in terms of the interests that the U.S. should be pursuing and has in Syria. So I just want to drill down a little bit from my former U.S. government policy hat um, what are the tools that we have to achieve those interests, to advance those interests? And to my read, we've got several tools um, currently on the table. Uh, one is the facts on the ground. Uh, we, we, with our SDF partners, do hold considerable territory in Syria, considerable natural resources, um, agrarian resources. That's not nothing. Um, our military, um, obviously, is a huge card to play. Our diplomatic leverage, our power of persuasion, our power to bring allies on board, this is another tool we have. Um, our economic tools, our sanctions. Um, Jumana, I know you have expertise also on the reconstruction side, so there's economic tools to play. Um, our assistance programs um, help us achieve objectives as well. Uh, and finally, we have the perception of our commitment, the perception of our credibility um, to actually use these tools to create outcomes. So those are our cards to play, um, and if we were having this panel, Nick, a year and change ago, I would have actually said that we were in a pretty good, hand, a pretty good position to deploy these tools effectively towards advancing these interests, not to achieve a perfect outcome in Syria, but salvaging a somewhat better one for our interests and for the Syrian people. I have to confess that in the subsequent year, um, I feel that we've made this lift considerably harder in terms of how we can actually use these tools to achieve our objectives. Um, first of all, on the military front, um, obviously there's been a tremendous amount of coverage and kerfuffle around the military presence in or out, withdrawal or not, what level of withdrawal. Even if the end point is that we are not withdrawing all that much or that there is some commensurate amount of allied troops that are coming in, whatever that, um, whatever that final or um, at least for now resting point is, uh, the reality is that we've already signaled our lack of commitment on the military backbone to this effort, and I think that has done significant damage. Uh, similarly, or, or in a related point, uh, whatever our troop level or our allied troop level ends up being, we've also seen in the past few months um, more demands be placed on what these troops will actually be doing. We're seeing now discussions of the safe zone in, in northern Syria. So we're being asked, to do, or these troops will be asked to be doing more with less. Um, so I think that undermines our military tool. Uh, on the diplomatic front, uh, with the, I think particularly with the arrival of Ambassador Jeffrey, we've seen a real rejuvenation and re-energizing of the U.S. diplomatic um, leadership role, which is terrific. I also think that our diplomatic bandwidth is being 
stretch really thin with many other objectives. So the part of our diplomacy that was directed towards achieving a better political outcome is now being siphoned off in all kinds of other directions. So we've got ongoing discussions with Turkey, obviously on the safe zone issue, on the S-400 issue, on the Iranian oil waiver issue. We've got a lot of fish to fry diplomatically just with Turkey at this moment. Um, additionally, our diplomatic core is being stretched towards tin cupping for other uh, stabilization assistance help, looking for other allies to bring in troops, dealing with the foreign fighter uh, issue that Dazdi Mulroy mentioned. So all of this means that our diplomatic uh, might is, not, um, is, is being stretched pretty thin. And then finally, I, I think we have to be realistic that the President's own signaling on lack of commitment to stay the course grievously undermines all the messages, including that Vasi Mulroy just gave about us being there for the long haul. Um, and all of the tools that I mentioned at the beginning become a lot less powerful when the perception is we can just be waited out. Um, so I think we need to be, I think we need to be sober and clear-eyed about that. Um, finally, I think that when we think about perceptions of our commitment, the perceptions that matter, and I'd be curious what my colleagues think about this, but it, to, to my mind, the perceptions that really matter are those of actors on the ground, adversaries on the ground, counterparts on the ground. And I think we here in Washington can sometimes have a tendency to create our own ecosystem and create our own sense of shared understanding, for example, that we are here for, in Syria for some amount of time. I was just in the region the last couple of weeks, and uh, the message I got from various actors, of course, there's a wide array of opinions, but the, the sense is we're leaving at some point. Uh, and Unsurprisingly, our partners and our adversaries are hedging and making bar bargains accordingly. There. Thank you, Francis. And I think this, what you've just said, opens us up to a to deep dive on this issue. You know, when, when we in our report, we ultimately came down on the fact that the United States has potentially tremendous leverage through its control over one third of Syria, some of its best resources, oil, ag agricultural land, electricity production, other elements, to try to shape an outcome that benefits U.S. interests. However, there is a strong counter-narrative to that. I've read you the quote on the top of this discussion about Syria having already been lost, being a land of sand and death. And there's a point that you raise I think is very interesting and important, which is how do you measure what success looks like, especially in a, conf a conflict environment like this, where you have foreign actors on the ground. They all have their zones of control. We have our zone of control. And they're, they're at loggerheads uh, as what the future of Syria looks like. So I wanted to ask you to really take us down this pathway. How would you assess sort of victory in Syria? And how do we prevent a U.S. investment in Syria looking something like we have in Afghanistan, where we're there a decade from now, a decade and a half from now? Yeah, so uh, let's take the first point first of sort of what, are, what is victory in Syria or what are we trying to achieve? Um, I, I do think about this a lot, and particularly with the eastern part of the country uh, that, you, that your report uh, analyzed so well. Um, I think when we think about our engagement in the East, um, we, there's basically two things I would say, our, our engagement being our military and civilian engagement. There's two things I would say. Uh, point number one is our engagement, um, particularly our assistance, is doing important, critically needed work um, in helping a devastated area. So these programs are doing demining, electricity, basic services, water, sanitation, really important work, support to civil society. Uh, these programs are, um, are doing really valuable work. At the same time, and this is point number two, I think we need to be clear-eyed that these programs and this engagement in this current context is not going to change the strategic outcome of the war. Um, and there's actually a bit of a history in terms of U.S. engagement in Syria, in my mind, of sort of hoping that civilian efforts or civilian programming could somehow um, tip the balance when ultimately military actors shape outcomes on the ground in Syria. Uh, and I have a long sort of backwards looking report on this um, for Carnegie, but in, in short, I think we're fooling ourselves if we think our uh, support to civilian actors uh, can, can somehow make up for our perceived lack of military commitment. Um, one way that one form of success in Syria or perhaps you know, our minimal threshold for success is the counter-ISIS objective, the enduring defeat or at least the containment uh, of ISIS. And if that's our objective, I think we actually have a lot of good learning from this context and other contexts on what that would take, what would be the requirements. So first of all, it would require security backbone 
uh, predictable security force. Uh, second of all, for civilian assistance programs, uh, as Jumana indicated, it, it does require programs that get at sort of the political grievances, the sense of injustice uh, that ultimately helps give root to ISIS in the first place. Uh, right now, our programs aren't, aren't really focused on that. They're focused on more sort of essential services, critical services. Uh, programs would also need to be, according to other, other research and other conferences, would really need to be well overseen by civilian oversight development professionals. We've had, I think, some good innovation in Syria with the Start Forward platform, but then that's also been sort of cast into doubt with the length of, of time, with the questions about the or length of time of being there. Um, in general, we need, if we're trying to sort of tamp down the conditions that gave rise to ISIS, we do need a long-term pr predictable presence, and we don't have that. Uh, finally, there's big questions about sort of what is the governance structure we're trying to empower in the East, which I'll return to in a second. How do we prevent this not looking, from, uh, looking like Afghanistan? Um, excellent question, and obviously Americans are uh, pretty concerned about another do-over. From my perspective, I think... Uh, we are chastened by the experience of Afghanistan. We are right to be chastened by the experience of stabilization, in particular in Afghanistan. I also feel like the Syria engagement is nothing like the Afghanistan engagement on this front. So qualitatively and quantitatively, we've got a fraction of the military personnel, 2,000 versus the over 100,000 uh, during the height of the surge in Afghanistan, a fraction of the civilian personnel, a fraction of the resources. So. And then finally, the, the largest difference which the DASD referenced is that we do have a quite technically capable, administratively capable partner on the ground that certainly went for their military skills, but also went for their sort of organizational administrative skills in the SDF. So in a lot of ways, it's very different from the Afghan stabilization experience. So that's not my major concern. I do think there's one parallel that should give us all pause, which is what is the political end state that these stabilization efforts are pointing towards, are driving towards? And in both cases, it's kind of questionable. In the Afghan case, we were trying to make a government more responsive and localized and decentralized, when ultimately the Afghan government didn't want to be more responsive, localized, decentralized. Uh, in the Syrian case, or in the Eastern Syrian case, uh, we've made it very clear we're not trying to bolster a permanent uh, SDF statelet. Uh, at the same time, we certainly don't want to be bolstering the regime. So there's a real question of what are all these stabilization efforts actually empowering and building towards, and I don't think we've answered that question yet. Thank you, Francis. And, you know, this, this highlights a point that we looked at in the report, which is this handover dilemma. You've, if you've invested in northern eastern Syria, made one-third of the country rehabilitated from the conflict, you've built up local organizations' capacity provide for the population, and then you have to hand it off to Bashar al-Assad. What does that mean? What type of dilemma do you there face? And I think this goes well with the question I'd like to ask Hassan. You know, Hassan, you, know, you alluded to this in your discussion to open the panel about sort of the challenges we face when it comes to how people lived the experience of ISIS on the ground. You've recently written some, I would like to say, hauntingly excellent articles about how ISIS has warped the social fabric in eastern Syria and the consequences of that. So I'd like to ask you a two-powder. First, focusing on eastern Syria, if you were going to design a counterterrorism policy to support the SDF and the U.S. and its partners to prevent sort of the reemergence of ISIS, how would you do it? How would you beat Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi at the battle he wants to face, which he said today, which is a war of attrition against the United States? <coughs> Well, thank you. So um, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm planting a lot of vegetables these days, so I'm going to use a, an agricultural uh, <laughs> sort of metaphor. Uh, the way I see Syria today, like just uh, forget all the discussions and kind of if you zoom in to the villages and towns in eastern Syria and elsewhere, the area is devastated. It's like uh, plowing uh, soil and it's like upside down. Uh, over the past five years, we defeated ISIS, but the current situation is really that sort of tilt, like uh, that, that soil that's really fertile, kind of uh, you know, ready to be to, to, for something to emerge out of, uh, out of the, in the soil. And uh, that's not success. That's not a failure for the organization. That's not success for you, uh, for the international community. It's really, um, it's just a, an environment, a new environment today. Uh, and the, uh, the biggest winner would be uh, the, the one who will be able to t take advantage of this. And today, just to give you an example, uh, my, um, 
I discussed this in the essay, but I didn't say, for example, that my, my village, for example, has been liberated for about three, four months now. And um, uh, people uh, were prevented to come back to this area because uh, it was dangerous, because ISIS rigged all the, the houses, including our house, uh, back home, my family's house. And uh, people, because of desperation, and this you have to understand, that people didn't leave their homes until the end because people had nothing else to, uh, you know, they, they, some people, because uh, you, you look at the areas that are under ISIS and say, if someone stayed this long at the ISIS, they must have liked the ISIS. No, it's not, that, it's not like that. People stayed there before ISIS and stayed on because they have, nothing, they have nowhere else to go. They, could, uh, they couldn't go travel outside, but also, uh, and this is just an example, because I think that, that sense uh, has a policy implication. Uh, I've been pushing my, uh, like asking my, uh, my parents to leave probably four, months, uh, four years ago, and they always insist that they can't, because there is a difficulty of that families who live, uh, live there for centuries, you no know, families like their, their, theirs and their ancestors, uh, who cannot just simply be uprooted from these areas. They have no, nowhere else to go. They live their, their lives and uh, uh, their, all, all their lives there. And now uh, you look at the SDF and what the U.S. is doing there, and you see there's a detachment, there's a disconnect from the policy to the reality of these people. Uh, so uh, for four months has been liberated this, uh, this hometown, but it's like a case that applies to other ones. Uh, but uh, every time people try to come back, they, they are told they cannot because the area is full of mines and so on and so forth. And the, uh, what, what I hear today from the U.S. officials and others is like no money is allocated to these uh, uh, villages. So basically, the U.S.-led coalition has destroyed these areas because there was a fight against ISIS. But they don't have the resources uh, to demine and make sure that people can come back and resume there. So there's resentment now. There's the resentment towards the SDF. There's resentment towards the U.S. because nobody is doing anything. So I don't know if you can call that a victory. Uh, in, in, in that sense, and, and th as long as you don't deal with these things, uh, a lot of people say, what's our interest in rebuilding Syria? It's not about rebuilding Syria. It's about recognizing that in 2014, the U.S. government made a decision to go to Syria and fight ISIS, and that mission is not completed. Uh, that mission uh, only led to destruction and devastation, and that devastation has to be addressed before you say our job is, is done. And, and I think, uh, to go back to your question directly, uh, I think the, the best way forward is to, to use that force that the U.S. created in eastern Syria uh, and enable it to become more representative of the local um, dynamics and more in tune with the local grievances. So they can, and I, I, and I, I am supportive of that, organ, uh, that uh, force. I think they have a chance to succeed where Assad uh, will fail to rebuild Syria and uh, reclaim these communities and build legitimacy. And I think they, already, uh, they are already seen by locals as a better option, a better alternative than the Assad regime, than the jihadis, and that even that, uh, than Turkey uh, in the, in the north, uh, northeast uh, and the north. So I think uh, the best way forward, and I, I disagree with that kind of uh, the handover, I think uh, there has to be a handover exit strategy that the U.S. at some point will say, to these locals, we need to hand you over to the Syrian state, but not to the Syrian regime, because that's not uh, the, the, uh, that's going to only undo all the success. Uh, what the U.S. has to be uh, focused it, uh, on, not rolling back Iran, because I think that's a waste of time for me uh, and for these communities there. Uh, rolling back Iran is not a uh, it should be a, a byproduct of the real policy. The real policy is to enable these forces uh, that have taken uh, taken uh, one third of Syria and make sure that when they, when they agree on a settlement with, with the Syrian state, meaning with Damascus, uh, there has to be a settlement where they are able to protect their areas from the jihadis and from Assad uh, or the regime. So the regime doesn't come back, but they, uh, they are almost like a, not an autonomy, but a decentralized form of governance uh, in these areas. And I think that applies also to Turkey in the north and uh, Idlib uh, in the northeast. Uh, they shouldn't be handed over to to the Assad regime, but should be integrated back into Syria uh, through this decentralization uh, form of governance. Thank you, Hassan. And that, I think, opens us up for the last question I want to ask the panel. And uh, Jumana, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges we identified when we wrote the report and we went through the analysis is what we like to call the Assad dilemma. How, do you, how does the United States approach the reality that Bashar al-Assad and his regime 
have consolidated their control over most of Western Syria, that there seems to be a built-in international consensus that the United States and the world will have to engage in one shape or another with the regime, and that fundamentally the, the past policy of not engaging with the regime has failed. And the way we looked at it was you have the current policy, which is to change the regime's behavior. Fundamentally, this is a change from what Secretary Tillerson said in January 2018 when he made regime change one of the pillars of U.S. policy in Syria. Uh, the current team under uh, Ambassador Jeffrey has tried to open up a runway for Russia to engage with the United States to achieve UNSCR 2254 goals, as uh, Dazdi Mulroy uh, indicated, and sort of move forward on this dilemma that we face of how do you bring Syria back under one government? I want to ask you, when you look at the Assad dilemma, and when you look at this question of, do we continue to change the regime's behavior? Do we try to engage with the regime or allow others to engage with the regime? Or you know what? At the end of the day, we cannot stabilize Syria. We cannot prevent it from being a source of destabilization unless Bashar al-Assad goes. And it's about time we leaned into that, like President Trump seemed to want to do this past April when he, when he ordered... Uh, then Secretary of Defense Mattis, kill them, kill them all, referring to the regime. Yeah. How do you approach the Assad dilemma? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> first of all, this is a very difficult question, and I, I, I liked how your report, for those of you who haven't read the report, I, I encourage you, you guys did a very good job of sort of laying out the, the six possible policy options. Um, and your, your second policy option, which was basically what the current administration is focusing on, on um, investing in stabilizing areas that are um, under our sort of our uh, orbit. Um, I think that was that's that's a relatively. I, I think it's one of the most feasible things that we should and can continue doing. I think adding to that though the maximum pressure campaign that that wasn't that the, that I know the current administration is slowly working towards, um, but hasn't fully I think gotten there. I think that's an important thing to tack on to that policy option number two. Um, it's, it's impossible uh, for ethical and moral reasons to promote the, um, to go back and to treat the Assad regime as though the past eight years has not happened. Um, but aside from it being moral and, and ethical, it's, it's, it absolutely won't even meet the interests that all three of us have laid out, the, even the critical U.S. interests that we have in terms of having a stable region, um, preventing the rise of extremism, uh, preventing p potentially another um, you know, uprising from happening. And I just, I wanted to start off by giving sort of just going on over, giving you an overview of what the, if, if we were to leave everything, if we were free to freeze Syria today, what it would look like if we were to walk away and say we're just leaving this as is. So you have, and I, and I wrote this in a Washington Institute piece that I, I published recently, the GDP has shrunk by four-fifths of what it was in 2010. The public revenue that the government had to spend has gone from 23% to 3% of the country's GDP. The lira has depreciated by 459%. And then UN ESQUA, among other institutions, have estimated the, the, the damage to be 400 billion. And then 65% of that is for the housing sector. So we're talking about homes that people cannot return to. They are they've, they've the ones suffered the most damage. Um, Syria's business community has largely fled. Um, and private investors, their, their percent of the GDP went from 12% to 4%. Um, all the current construction efforts that we've seen in these, these lavish sort of Disney World type, uh, you know, buildings and high-rise high -rise, uh, high buildings and, and entertainment projects, you have a, a bedroom that costs about, I think, half a million dollars, something that is completely out of reach for the average Syrian, let alone the refugee that, that the Russian government and that the, the Syrian government are, are trying to convince us to, that they will take back. Um, it, you have um, the, the legislative decree 63 that's meant to seize any property for anyone that the regime considers a terrorist. There's obviously no due process, no proper um, uh, you know, hearing or anything for when they're seizing this property. Um, the policies of the government have largely returned to that that we saw in the 80s. I mean, the people that the regime is bringing back to, to sort of be its, uh, around, uh, to surround it, in addition to those that the Iranians and the Russians have put in the, in the Assad regime, have been like Jamil Hassan and Ali Mamluk, the same people who executed 
the repressive policies under Hafez al-Assad. Very little has changed in terms of their, their approach and their techniques with the Syrian people, even after eight years of bloodshed and a million people almost dead. Um, you have, the only difference in this situation, and I think this is the, the part that's very critical, is that Syria has lost much of its sovereignty. So whereas in the 80s, Syria, the Syrian government largely called the shots, you now have Iran and Russia who are actively pressuring the regime um, uh, into going into different directions that benefit them, obviously, and not, and not the Syrian people. The detention file that, that, that we discuss often, that the UN discusses often, it's an ongoing file. We're not just talking about the 100,000 or so that the regime had previously arrested. People are constantly being arrested until now and being detained. Um, they're even detaining people who are well-known advocates of their cause. I mean, Wissam al-Tayr, he was the admin of Dimashq al-An, which is one of the most... Um, vocal sort of pro-regime Facebook pages. He critiqued the regime for its corruption practices. And he, he's, he's, since for four months, I think he's been detained. They assume he's dead. Um, there's refugees. There was a refugee who was just, um, he just was a money exchanger. I think that's, I don't know if there's a proper term for him. But basically, he just helped exchange money in Lebanon. He returned, and within two days, um, he was detained and he went missing. Um, and so, and so this, these, this, is, this is really, I mean, in, and even the refugees that have come in that were humanitarian, let's say people who fled solely for humanitarian reasons, did not have any, did not participate actively in any protests against the regime. When they're coming, they're not being allowed to go back to their homes, um, which is a part of 2254, which I'll go, in, I'll go into next, but they're not being allowed to go there. They have to actually get their names vetted by every single security branch in Syria, and only then can they go back. And this hasn't, we haven't actually documented one instance where this has been the case, especially for those who are from, you know, Daraya or from any of the areas that the regime considered, um, uh, let me find the, the English, the, the incubators for the revolution, yeah, for, the, for, the, um, for the revolution. Um, and so, and, and so looking, looking at this as at what you're looking, you know, at, at Syria, even the oil crisis, a lot of that is, is largely due to production. I mean, we're, we're down to 5% of the previous production in 2011. I think previously, from 2010 to 2011, the year average was 4, 400,000 barrels of oil a day. We're now to, they said, an average about of 17,000 barrels a day. So production largely is due to sort of the destruction, the war, um, Etc. And then the secondary reason is uh, the oil crisis that's happening. You know, Iran's lack of um, inability or um, you know refusal to provide the Assad regime with oil over the last six months that we saw, you know, heavily publicized uh, last week. Um, in, in people under the regime, like I said, the 80, the tactics of the 80s have gone back to you know severe repression of society. Um, there was, there, we've only seen one instance, very, very small instance of protests in Dara, and that was largely because it was under Russian control, and it was when the regime was trying to put a new statue of Hafez al-Assad, mind you, not spending any of any money it has um, to feed or clothe or provide medically for any of these people, but instead chose to put a statue, and so you saw some protests in Dara from people who had done reconciliation with the regime, but these are people who were anti-regime from the beginning. Um, and, but I, we haven't seen any similar protests in any other part of Syria, and most likely because they don't dare sort of after um, the chilling effect that the, that the Assad regime has, has had um, on, on people. Even the humanitarian aid, I, I, I co-founded a humanitarian organization. We work largely in Idlib, but we do follow what's happening in, in regime-held areas. And in areas where the INGOs are operating and the United Nations are operating, you have the regime really flexing its muscles, dictating to the UN what it, who it can and cannot hire. The same applies to INGOs, um, who it can and cannot procure from, um, and which areas it can provide humanitarian aid for. Of course, these are largely areas that are sympathetic to the regime. Um, and so if we were to stop and freeze and return our normal relationships with Assad, this is, this is the picture that we're going to see. Um, there is no reason to think that Assad would act differently, that he would start distributing humanitarian aid differently, or that he would, you know, um, relax any of the, you know, the harsh um, uh, laws and regulations and, and really fear tactics that he has on the people. Now, if Assad goes, um, there are, you know, I, I, I said that in, in my piece, um, I had said that if to remove...
to remove sanctions, the first thing that you need to do is acquiescence to 2254. And the reason I think that's an impossibility um, and, and, and completely far-fetched is because it's essentially the regime committing suicide. I mean, if, you, if those have actually read 2254, it requires the regime, and this is something, remember, that Russia acquiesced to. I mean, it's actually signed on, agreed to this. But it requires the, op uh, that the government and the opposition to agree in formal negotiations on a political transition, a transition away from Assad that leads to credible, inclusive, and non-sectarian governance. Um, it's also, um, it's, it asks for immediate seizure on any um, attacks against civilians, and it requires and, and demands um, uh, compliance with international humanitarian law. These are all things that the regime is not doing and would, 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 would adamantly refuse to do safe and voluntary return of refugees. That's also something it most likely doesn't even have an interest in doing. Um, and so I, I, I cannot see in good faith the regime doing this unless it's willing to commit suicide. That's the only way that I believe that 2254 can actually be complied with with the regime. Now there's some, I've talked to some um, experts who say there's, there are some scenarios where if the Russians were to pull their cover, their military cover, because they are on the ground helping the regime sort of direct the military fight, that if Russia were to step away from the Assad regime, this may put the regime under um, you know, fire in terms of it wouldn't be enough to just have Iranian support, especially with the renewed sort of um, sanctions. Um, it wouldn't be enough for the regime to say we're willing to take on the Kurdish opposition, uh, the Kurds and, and the areas of opposition. This, this might be one scenario, I, but I'm, I'm not a Russian expert, so I don't want to talk about the likelihood of that, but there were experts who said this might be one scenario. Another, um, another one is, is, and this is part of 2254, is elections, right, is is 2021 elections. Um, the French, I think, are trying to push it up to, 20, uh, to have them in 2020. Now, the Russians are pushing for this, obviously, because they are pretty confident in where that there is no other character um, that can compete against Assad. Even if you, we were, you know, if you, if you look at sort of the, the potential voters outside of Assad regime, you might have 11.5 million if you include the refugees, the Kurdish-held areas, those 3.5 million to 4 million in, in Idlib and countryside of Aleppo, um, and then those diaspora members that would qualify. It still would likely be under the, you know, the number uh, in regime-held areas that would be forced to vote for Assad. But if there was international backing of a potential character to run against Assad that could have the support of both Kurds and opposition you know, um, leaders, this might be one scenario. Once again, I haven't seen any such figure, but I don't want to eliminate the possibility of, of you know, of, of Syrians reaching that kind of, I mean, the, the Syrians haven't been able to develop that kind of opposition for a whole host of reasons that I'm not going to go into now. Um, you'll still have the Alawite community that remains um, an issue, and this would probably factor into if we're looking for international backing for a character that, you know, ensuring some of, some of these concerns that people have for the minorities, especially the Alawites who don't see their... Um, their future yet divorced from Assad's future safely. Um, the last thing I'll say, if, if Assad were to leave unwillingly for some reason, if someone were to get rid of him, you asked me this a couple of days ago, if someone were to assassinate him or something like that, I mean, I, what would happen? You said what would happen the next day? Um, my understanding from, from the folks that I've talked to is that the Russians and the Iranians would really scramble to, to, to put someone that would obviously ensure their interests that they would agree on. Mahir al-Assad seems like a most likely uh, scenario, but he still to them is not as um, sort of rational and, and um, capable as Bashar al-Assad. So he's, you know, he's a bit more of an eccentric figure, I think, compared to his brother, which is not, I mean, it's not saying much. I mean, it's, it's, you have a, a very interesting family there. But, but, it's, but that's what people say would, who would likely come next if that were, if that were to be the scenario. Um, and I'll, 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 stop, I'll stop there. I, yeah, there's a lot that we said. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Jumana, for a very comprehensive answer. And I think that's quite a takeaway, that to ask the regime to change its behavior is to ask it to commit suicide. And it's something I think I'll take from this panel. Um, before we go to a very quick Q&A, we have time for a few questions with short responses from the panel. I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, our partner, Sasha ghosh Siminoff, who's here in the audience today. He and his organization, People Demand Change, which is one of the best, uh, if not the best, organizations working on the ground in Syria.
They've collaborated closely with us on this report, and the report, I believe, has come out as strongly as it has because of their partnership. So thank you, Sasha, for joining us. We have time for a short round of questions. We'll take them all together with short responses from uh, the panel. So start here up front. Do I need a mic? Or? Okay. Uh, Lori Milroy, Curtis Dan Zadon, Curtis Dan 24. Um, I want to thank you. Very interesting. I thought I heard two different perspectives. One, ISIS is defeated. It is defeated in Syria, it's defeated in Iraq, which is also my view. And that the underlying problem is political. That the people who live in those areas where ISIS controlled need a resolution, need their problems addressed. They need to see that the political authority somehow represents them and addresses their needs. Is that a reasonable uh, way to put it? That the underlying problem and the way to address it is political. And the second point I'd like to suggest, and maybe you, you, this, this center might do something about this later on, the idea ISIS is never defeated. We've, it's not been defeated now because there was a video of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Americans have been at this thing, flogging, fighting Islamic extremism, for 19 years. Every president since then has at one time or another proclaimed victory, only to have this thing reemerge. Is it possible that we don't understand it? For centuries of Islamic history, there have been times when the caliph is a figurehead for brutal individuals, military men, ruling the area, and they use Islam as a legitimizing device. Is it possible that that is the case now? Thank you. We had two questions, three questions here in the back. So good. Hi. Uh, Elior Katz, I'm at Brookings. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, the Iranian influence insofar as the, I mean, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that was, um, received a lot of attention about Shia militias sort of forcing people to convert to Shia in exchange, Shiism in exchange for security, uh, food, etc. So I was wondering if you could speak to how actually prevalent that phenomena is. Um, and also, uh, backing off of that, it, with um, Iran facing financial constraints, will that, how do, do you think that Iran will... Uh, back out of, of Syria, or how, how might that uh, play into the dynamics? Hi, it's Doğan Işık from Turkish Embassy. I just want to ask Mr. Hassan uh, what the locals in, say, Raqqa or their resort feel about the veneration of Öcalan uh, uh, that they see in SDF. Thank you. I think that's it for questions. We'll be able to engage with the panelists. Uh, we'll have a short break uh, after this. So I'd like to see who would like to take questions first. Um, so very quickly on the, uh, the first question on ISIS. My read of the situation, I, I'm not going to speak to the global uh, insurgency of ISIS. I know Hassan has written on that. But um, is yes, it's political drivers. The, um, and in general, it is political grievances, a sense of injustice that would give rise, either in the short run or probably more likely the medium or long run, to a resurgence. What form that takes, I certainly cannot predict. But um, I do think, that, yeah, the, the point about political representation and grievances being at the heart of this and being why this is a really hard policy challenge uh, for the next year, five years, ten years, uh, specific to Syria, I think is, is a real challenge. And it, it sounds like from what we were saying on the panel that we should the Assad regime retake eastern Syria, we don't see a likelihood that those grievances will be addressed in an inclusive fashion. So that perhaps reinforces Hassan's point about the need to build up and make a more representative uh, force in eastern Syria. On the Iranian influence question, um, I, I haven't seen further reports beyond the journal article you mentioned, which I have seen, but, but to me the big takeaway here is that Iran is playing a long game. Iran is playing a soft power game as well as a hard power game. I think we sometimes fixate on the hard power elements of Iranian presence in Syria, which are as I understand it, considerable. Uh, but if, if we're truly serious about pushing back Iranian influence, I think we need to look closely at how they're exerting powers in, in all of these other, perhaps more subtle, but quite effective ways. That's it. Awesome. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll sum up uh, my answer and say, by saying, uh, 
I understand, that obviously, the policy fatigue here that people don't want to do anything outside uh, the U.S. But in my opinion, in, in the case of Syria, I think there's convergence between U.S. interests and what needs to be done uh, the right way in Syria, uh, in a way that wasn't the case, say, before 2014. Because before, you could uh, talk to idealists and say, this is a pro-democracy <laughs> uprising, uh, help it so you can change a dictator and you make the region uh, less volatile than, than before. And I thought that would be a, a compelling uh, argument. But say that, uh, kind of just to the cynics who don't uh, believe in this and they don't see, see the U.S. role as, or kind of the U.S. as uh, having that role in the world. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that argument changed in 2014 uh, into another argument, which is uh, Syria is a problem, is a festering wound. If you don't deal with it today, uh, you will have problems for the long term. You can think of Afghanistan, you can think of Iraq, you can think of other, uh, other places. But, uh, but in order to uh, resolve that problem, in order to deal with the festering wound, uh, the only right way is to do it the right way for the people, in a way that affects. So basically, the interests of the locals have somehow converged with the, with the U.S. Uh, well, uh, interest uh, in, the, in the region in order to make uh, prevent uh, extremism or even uh, other issues, not just extremism, uh, from uh, being there for a long time. Iran can uh, also consider that is to empower these voices that are opposed to the regime, uh, but not in a political sense. It's just like the, it's become a reality that the majority of the country uh, needs to be dealt in a different way uh, than before. Uh, so I'll just I'll just say that. Um, I was just going to touch on the Iran question. Um, I haven't heard of too many other reports that have been published beyond that as well. But, um, I mean, Iran, you have to remember, it's brought, they say, estimated between 80 to 100,000. It has it, not of its own people, obviously, but that have, they have brought from Lebanon, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan. Um, and it has, you know, it has placed them throughout different various areas of Syria and Homs, where I was born. It's, it's pretty much an Iranian-controlled city now. Um, and uh, so they're, they're definitely, like she said, they're playing the long run that even if they financially, some of their, they have to pull some of their um, backing for the Syrian government, they are laying the groundwork for them to come back even if it's 10 or 15 years because they are committed to really that territory that they need to shuttle back between Iraq and, and Lebanon. And I'll just to address the question about Ocalan, I would say that when Ocalan wrote the, the, his treatise on the democratic confederalism, and it began to be implemented in northern eastern Syria. He did it with an eye on addressing northern and eastern Syria's diverse communities and how to avoid inter-ethnic and inter-sectarian conflict, which scarred that region of Syria in 2004 and, and is a fundamental objective of the Syrian Democratic Forces Coalition. And that in many ways, that theory will be sort of the guiding governance theory that is unfolded in northern and eastern Syria. On that note, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for discussion and thank the panelists for the very comprehensive answers. And we'll do a five-minute break.